Your Excellency, thank you very much for granting us this interview here on the plains of the Kwihaba area. I'm told the tree behind us is Mongongo tree. That's what they say, yes. Yes. Thank you very much. I'd like to start off uh, the discussion with uh, public services. Um, when you came into office in 2008, delivery, uh, service delivery, became one of your immediate priorities and you pronounced on this. I want to ask you, has your government measured or assessed the performance of the public service? And if so, how has this been done? Well, let me start off by saying that the reason why I put so much emphasis on delivery was specifically because at the end of the day, as the word would suggest, public service means exactly that. And the quality and the productivity of our services that we deliver as a government to the people of Botswana was how they would be able to benefit in their daily lives from those services. So the better we are at performing those services, then the better we are able then to look after our people. So we have set up a, a, a regime whereby we conduct reviews every six months of all ministries, their performance, and they report to me every six months, as I've said, in order to gauge how these services are being provided to the public. With respect to how they perceive these services, any feedback? We indeed, we've, we've had um, uh, assessments done um, both by ourselves and through Bokin um, to see how they feel the, the, the public is benefiting from these services. So indeed we have got feedback and of course as you would expect in everything there are different opinions. Some would say for certain ministries um, the service is adequate, satisfactory, good, not so good and so it differs from ministry to ministry and it differs from department to department within a specific ministry. So, for example, you'll find um, the areas that we are trying to, to, one of the things that have been challenges, is where we have people standing in queues for a long time, waiting for services, whether it's for um, driver's licenses, um, getting passports, getting their omangs and what have you, going to the revenue offices. Um, in those sort of areas, um, whenever you have to wait in a queue, People don't want to be spending the whole day waiting in queues. So those are areas that we focus a lot of attention on as well. And I think over time we have been able to improve um, quite markedly uh, those services as well. But we've still got some way to go. But it's something which is evolving. In a lot of your public meetings, you regularly speak about the importance of productivity to the economic growth of this country and for the competitiveness of the country. How perhaps do you motivate the public service um, and both the private sector to perform on this very important issue? Something I've always said is that I shouldn't have to motivate people to work for their country. As I've said in the past, at the end of the day we only have one country. There's nowhere else where we would rather be than in our own Botswana. And therefore to have to be seen to be constantly telling people to work harder to be more productive, I think is not really necessary. But anyway, at the end of the day, we know that our work ethic as a nation is not as good as it needs to be. And we need to step up our game in that regard. So we are trying to say that this is now a global world. It's a global economy. And we are competing with others, you know, all the time. The, the level of competitiveness is, is really, um, you know, is raging at such a level that you would see that we would be left behind if we did not uh, improve our work ethic. So it's something that we will continuously repeat. We have engaged now recently the BNPC to start engaging more with government and the private sector when it comes to the productivity drive. I just want to move on, Your Excellency, to some of the key um, services, if you like. We ended up 2013 with two major challenges that faced this nation, lack of water or shortage of water and power supply. What do you think in the new season the nation can look out for in terms of solutions to water and power problems? Well, the first thing I can say is to assure Botswana that it is a very high on our priority list because when you talk about energy and water, those are strategic um, to our well-being as a nation. 
uh, coming to water, the welfare of every individual to have water, adequate water supply is very important. For the development of our economy, water supply is also very important. But as you know, Botswana is a country, as we have realized in recent times, we are prone to drought. And what we have to there do is to harvest the water, the whatever amounts we get, even if it's very little at times, harvest it in the best way that we can adequately reticulate it amongst the population. And there are certain areas of this country, as you well know, are more hard hit than others when it comes to water supply. And you know, at the end of the day, we are so dependent on the rains. So what we are trying to do is when we, during the challenging economic times we've been going through recently, the, some of the projects that we, we gave as priorities as key were the con continuing to establish reservoirs, dams, um, to harvest that water and for its reticulation. Projects like the North-South Carrier, we have brought forward some, uh, the second phase of it was supposed to be done in NDP 11, but we've decided to make a sacrifice with our budget to bring it forward. And also to also bring forward our share of the Chobis and Busy waters to start on that project as well, so that we can be assured of uh, water security going forward. And we've spent hundreds of million, we allocated a few hundred millions, up to 600 million pula in the last financial year. We'll be continuing with that program this year throughout the country in exploration, prospecting for water and its reticulation. How soon do you think you will see that becoming a reality? Uh, when it comes to energy, um, we had uh, realized that bringing in uh, electricity supplies from neighboring countries, um, although when you look at the, um, the, 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 the way we compare the economies of scale, it would probably be cheaper to bring in ESCOM power into Botswana. This was a decision uh, many years ago. Because producing it yourself um, through thermal um, enemy su uh, uh, energy supply, um, the use of coal, is expensive. Um, but as you're aware, South Africa has its challenges. You know, they're also a, a fast-growing economy. And, and their energy supply is struggling to keep up. So we, we recognized some years ago that we would need to be self-sufficient when it came to electricity. And that's why we embarked upon the Murupule B uh, power scheme um, to give us 600 megawatts by the end of last year. That unfortunately was not achieved by the contractor. So we find ourselves a year down the line with that uh, particular power pond not fully up and running. Um, our demand in the country is about 580 at peak times, 580 megawatts. Um, so what we are going to be doing now is we are going to be refurbishing, starting this year hopefully, a Murupule A, which gives 130, so about 130 megawatts. We are also this year going to be embarking upon the development of another 300 megawatts at, uh, called Murupule C, a brownfield project, Komurupule, and another 300 megawatts, a greenfield project around the Mamabula area. And of course we do have the 90 megawatt um, diesel powered station in Orapa and the other 70 megawatt power station in Mutsalakhabedi. And we have a guaranteed 100 megawatt supply from ESCOM in South Africa and 100 megawatts of non-guaranteed supply from the same source. And I would like to also take this opportunity to really um, thank the South African government and ESCOM for having um, extended their engagement with Botswana beyond uh, last year. Uh, when they realized and we had appealed to them that we're having these difficulties at Murupule. But we now think with the new arrangements in place, uh, we will overcome those. So certainly in the future, um, we are going to make sure we never ever have a deficit again of power. And so you think uh, most probably we will see a much reduced possibility or reoccurrence of load shedding? You know, I'm not going to say no or yes to that. Those things are machines, they are man-made. Things can go wrong, as we have seen. We were assured a year ago we would have 600 megawatts. It didn't happen. So we had done everything that we could have done as a government and as BPC to ensure you got a contractor, the due diligence was done on the contractor, but we were let down. Um, so we have now taken measures 
And, and these are fa problems facing governments from time to time. Your best laid plans can go wrong, and therefore you have a plan B. We are putting that in place, and so far it is working for us. So we are hopeful, and let me say, um, fairly confident that going forward, um, those days of load, shed load shedding are, are behind us. But what I can assure the nation is that um, even going forward beyond this year and the next year, the plans that we have got as backups to ensure that we have surplus power, there will never be load shedding um, in, in, the, in the years to come. So it's possible this year we, we may have some challenges, depending if South Africa, for example, ESCOM find they uh, themselves are not able to supply us, then we certainly are going to be challenged. But at least for now we are keeping our fingers crossed. And, and since I gave the undertaking that by the end of July last year, we should have seen load shedding, we have pretty much kept to, to that target. I'm just drawn to ask you on the basis of what you were saying, to ask, we are not surely depending on only ESCOM as an alternative source of supply. Don't we have other sources that we... Well, yes, I mean, like the Kasani area, there's electricity that comes in from Zambia. In the, the west of the country, in the northwest, in the Shakawe area, in the Okavango constituency, we have um, a power supply coming in from, from, from Namibia. Um, but, you know, as I say, all these, again, mean that we are reliant on external uh, power. And I don't think that is satisfactory. As much as we are grateful to those countries for having supplied us over the years, um, we need to be able to be self-sufficient. And, you know, we've got new mines which are coming up. And, and, and we know, again, in the northwest of the country, we've got these new copper mines coming up. They are needing uh, electricity supply, main supply and to get away from diesel plants, which are very, very expensive to run. So these are things which we are going to have to expedite. I want to move on, Mr. President, to health as one of the major uh, services or key services that people take interest in in this country. During 2012-2013, government relocated uh, some health services to the Minister of Health, and some believe that this was a desirable move because total care, if you will, came under one roof and on the face of it became uh, effective. How efficient, in your view, say, is the provision of health care in Botswana? I'm thinking about availability of general medicine, uh, doctor nest to patient ratio, and hospital facilities. I think with um, taking the last point first, the, the hospital facilities um, are becoming adequate. You know, some of the last uh, big hospitals we built, Ko uh, Maun, um, go, go soroe, the, 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 um, uh, for example, go, 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 mahalape. you'll find that with our population, um, like with some of our senior secondary schools, we have now got those kind of facilities now there in place um, which cater for the whole population. The only thing is maybe the issue of um, the location. Because because we are a small population, but scattered in many parts of the country, we can't, of course, have hospitals dotted all over the place because you're going to find a hospital um, with beds lying, lying empty. So, yes, people do have to travel to those facilities, but in total, the hospital facilities we have um, are adequate when it comes to, 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 to beds. But a lot of them, as well, need to be upgraded. You know, if you go around uh, the country, uh, places like Kobokanye, Komuchudi, Koletlakani, just to name a few, Gasani and so on, we have to upgrade those facilities. Because since they were built, um, certainly they're not able to cater for the, the population. You've got places like Komushupa, um, where they've long been promised a primary hospital. That still remains in place. The problem has been, of course, with all the competing demands on the budget, and especially in recent times, um, we have not been able to move as fast in upgrading those facilities um, as we could have. Khabaruni, for example, we know Princess Marina is congested, but with the new medical hospital coming up, which will also double as a referral hospital, we will be able to take care of the congestion um, in, 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 in the Khabaruni area. So from that point of view, um, I think we are, we are making progress. Um, on the need to have put it all under one roof, that was an important decision. Because, you know, when you split the responsibilities between two ministries for health care, if things don't go, go quite right, you'll always have finger pointing. 
one at the other. So the best thing is say, let's have one um, point of contact for responsibility when it comes to healthcare. No excuses. So that's why we said everything should go under the Ministry of Health. They too wanted it because they felt that some of the healthcare programs that should be put in place were not being done adequately when they were um, divorced from themselves. So that was another reason why that, that move was taken. Coming to the point of the, the drug supply, this has been a challenge. Because, you know, one of the problems has been that um, whether it was under local government before, I mean, when they were doing it, or central government, you had one point, the CMS, who were responsible for ordering um, medication and for its delivery. Um, so you had a situation whereby the logistics of knowing how much medication to order and then to send it on. And, you know, with drugs, the most important thing is the, the use-by date because you can't give people expired drugs. So when you order drugs and you put it on the shelf, you have to have a system in place which can fairly accurately assess that drugs should not expire on the shelves. And, you know, should, shouldn't stay. So in other words, you don't order drugs which are not used very often, which means they expire on the shelves and you lose all that money because then they have to be uh, disposed of. So that system was something which they were battling with for, for a long time. Um, ordering all these different types of drugs. And, you know, and I invite you to go and see the CMS one time and just see the entire range of drugs that they have to get. And then there's also the issue of ordering. All the clinics and health posts and hospitals and primary hospitals ordering on time so that they made sure that in their particular facilities, when you have drugs on the shelves, um, you take the initiative to be proactive and ensure that you don't wait for the drug to get finished on the shelf and then you order because then you have a time when people are not going to be able to have drugs. So you have to add, you know, um, order the drugs well in time to take into account the transporting of them back to your facility. So these are things which are being worked on and I must say that the level of drug supply has improved greatly than what it was uh, two years ago. And, and again, it's an area that I'm confident that what has been put in place and something new that the Ministry of Health have done in engaging um, and outsourcing the distribution and transportation of drugs to the medical facilities uh, this year is also going to, go, is going to go well. Where do you think then say the gap is? Because quite often you still hear people saying such and such a drug isn't available at the dispensaries and hospitals and clinics. And as you say, we hear that at the ordering point, exactly. the medicines are available. It's because of, you know, it's that is the ordering point. Point. It's also the issue which, has, which was dogging us for a number of years, whereby with the budget cycle and with the, the ordering and the tendering, that, you know, you, things have to be tendered for. So, as I say, it's all a matter of logistics and administration of ensuring that things are done. That's why we brought in an external consultancy to help the CMS put all these things in place. Uh, recently, um, we have said that it can happen that maybe some of these drugs may uh, run out or be a bit in short supply in government facilities. And that's why we, are, we have started to allowing um, citizen-owned pharmacies to be able to also step in and fill the gap, should that happen to provide Botswana uh, with drugs. So again, we must always, we are now putting in backups for if in the event that on our side uh, we, we have the kind of problems we faced in the past. But as I say, I'm confident going forward when we look at the percentage availability that things are improving greatly. I'd like to move on to education now. Obviously it plays a key role in the economy. Um, the world over Botswana is no, no different to the extent that it can provide a human resource base sufficiently equipped to service both the public and the private sectors. I want to ask you, to what extent do you think our education system is able to produce specialized skills, such as in medicine and other skills? Well, as you know, and we've just discussed it, that when you talk about medicine, we have been anyway for many years uh, producing our own nurses and, nurses and pharmacists in this country. And um, later this year, I think it is, the, the medical school 
will be completed and we'll then be able to train our own doctors um, because we have been totally reliant on, on, on foreign doctors for many years and they're still far in the majority in, in this country than our own citizen doctors. So with that advent, you know, that will improve greatly. And the Minister of Education and the various ministries like the Ministry of Minerals, Energy and Water Resources are now working together. So for example, when we see that going forward, we are going to see more and more mining activity in this country. So the Ministry of Minerals and the Ministry of Education are coming together to ensure that we, the courses that are being offered in this country in some of the technical colleges would be geared towards a particular sector, like the mineral sector, to ensure that our people are ready and educated and trained to be able to take up those jobs in a, any particular sector as they come. So we are certainly training now for the economy. We have made deliberate decisions um, that in certain areas where we have oversubscribed in the past, when it comes to any courses, whether it's at the UB or in technical colleges, we are re rearrange those to ensure that, and an exercise was done anyway to, 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 to implement this, to ensure that we train for the economy, that where the jobs are going to come from, we have got people ready to take them up because they would have had the qualifications to do so. There was a lot of interest, Your Excellency, around the University of Science and Technology boost. How far is that project? Where are we with it? Well, we expect that um, uh, this year the, the, the intake uh, will be in place. Um, as we know, there were delays um, with the project, and that's why we started off the students at the, uh, in, in Audi. Uh, but now we have got the staff in place, the students will be, will, be, will be moving across there. So I think after this, things will be... We had to, of course, think about the phase two of the project. Because again, at the time when the economic downturn hit us, um, Bust's phase two was one of those projects which was going to cost us a lot of money. And we had to rethink whether we wanted to pursue uh, the phase two of the university and we as you know we put together a task team and and they came up with certain recommendations eventually government decided that we would continue uh, with phase two and even if we can't do it within the time frame we had expected but at least we will do it in we will create more phases so that eventually we get to where we are with with boost i want to ask you about the adequacy of education facilities in Luzon, particularly at primary and secondary school levels this is to say, what, for example, informs the distribution of schools around the country? And to what extent do you believe the system has catered for the less privileged of our communities or remote area dwellers? What informs the location of schools is population. And that has been the basis of all our development plans by this government. Um, that where you have most of the population um, that's where you would put. So you'd have a, a center which would um, cater for a, an, a particular area. So when I referred earlier to hospitals, and I also mentioned senior secondary schools, indeed, um, we can't put a senior secondary school, as a lot of Botswana ask for, in their particular village or their particular town. So what you have is you have a catchment area. So you'll have a senior secondary school which will have a catchment area for a number of villages in that particular district um, because you've got the classrooms um, to be able to absorb all those students. Otherwise it would mean breaking up these senior secondary schools into very small um, units which would not be cost effective. So yes, once again, you know, people would, would don't like to see their kids traveling long distance to go to senior secondary school. But when you think in any country, in any education facility, even if it's a university. I mean, we have the University of Botswana. Every citizen would have to travel from any corner of the country to go to the UB. We can't put a university in every village, in every town. So certain um, categories of education facilities are going to have to be put up to serve catchment areas because it's not cost effective to have them uh, spread all, you know, all over the place. So um, from that point of view, um, I think we are satisfied uh, with the way we are doing it. And when you talk about remote area dealers, again, there in all those, in all those uh, settlements and, and villages, uh, we ensure that we do have 
uh, primary uh, school facilities for them. Uh, we have also um, introduced affirmative action for them, as you are aware, because of the various dynamics, which I don't want to go into, um, that you would see sometimes a problem with attendance of their children at school, maybe sometimes because of their culture, because of their location, um, and therefore what happens is that in some cases, not in all, but in some cases, you'll see um, year on year the results not being very good. And therefore when they don't get the adequate results, so they don't score the, the, the adequate points um, to go into two tertiary uh, institutions, um, they, they lose out. So with affirmative action, we'll say that no, we must take into account their particular situation locally, the, 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 the challenges that they have, because their kids going to school there is not like other kids going to school in Khaburuni. So we then need to make a special effort um, to incorporate them into the mainstream. And that's why we introduced affirmative action for them. And we've now, every year we monitor, and since we introduced it a couple of years ago, we monitor the numbers that we take under affirmative action into our tertiary institutions so that they should not lose out because they happen to be living in remote areas. I want to conclude this particular section, Mr. President, with a piece from the teaching profession because in recent times, teachers have been quite vociferous about their conditions of service and relations with government. To ask you, have you been aware of any such concerns and if so, how have you dealt with them? I am aware and I've actually called and I had two meetings with teachers um, at State House in the last couple of years to hear from them what their concerns are. But you know, I don't just want to talk about teachers when you talk about their conditions of service. You know, during the time when there was a lot, of, a lot going on about the teachers' conditions of service, there were teachers who had since retired, who I met, who used to remind me and say to me, you know, but when we were teachers, teachers was a full-time job. We worked from early in the morning, we worked until late in the day. We would work on weekends. Uh, we would take our kids out on school trips, doing these um, activities, our sports and what have you. Uh, and, and, and we just took that as part of the, uh, the job. And you know, 